The new Razer Blade 15 is a laptop aimed at young, happening, stylish people with good hair. And if you happen to like music that has no sense of melody, so much the better. I take the whole city down with this. And I am the ideal man to guide you through a review of this laptop. This is the new Razer Blade 15. That's it, that's the entire name. 15 because the screen is 15.6 inches on the diagonal. Blade because every laptop from Razer seems to be called a blade. You have a choice of a Core i7 or Core i9 processor from Intel. We're talking 12th gen Alder Lake, so a combination of P cores and E cores, and RTX 3000 graphics from Nvidia. RTX 3060, 3070 Ti, or 3080 Ti. Amazingly, this tiny chassis packs an RTX 3080 Ti, albeit with a Core i7 rather than the Core i9. The chassis itself measures a fraction under 17mm thick or thin, depending on your point of view, and the weight of the chassis is just over 2 kilos. 2.01 kilos to be precise. You must imagine there's a designer somewhere wishing to goodness they could have shaved a few more grams out of it to get it down to 1.99999. The power brick is 230 watts, relatively small, and then you have the mains cable. So as a package to lug around in your bag, not too bad. When you look inside the chassis, you'll see the cooling system is a whacking great big vapor chamber cooler, which is very similar to the one that we saw when Luke reviewed a razor blade that had Intel 10th gen hardware along with RTX 2000 graphics. It's thinner, lighter, and more grunty than the laptop you could have bought a year and a half ago. Our review sample of the Razer Blade 15 comes with 32 gigabytes of dual channel DDR5 4800 megahertz memory. That's plenty. However, because it's regular memory not soldered on board, you can if you choose upgrade either now or in the future. The SSD is a one terabyte gen four item and there's a second slot so you can add more storage with the minimum of fuss and bother. The panel. I like the look of this display. It's a full HD 360Hz display, which is clearly enormously fast. However, it's only 300 nits in brightness. If you go to the Quad HD option, that is also 300 nits. The 4K is 400 nits. To my mind, 4K on a panel of this size is too much. You're gonna to have to scale the display without any doubt whatsoever. Quad HD, you'll probably wanna scale it. This panel I've been using at 100%, no scaling required. I would, however, have appreciated more brightness, but in terms of color, look, viewing angle, it's good. Let's take a look at the ports and connectors. There are none on the front, nothing on the back. Everything is on the two sides. On the left-hand side, we have the power connector. Two USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A's, one USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type C, and a three and a half millimeter combo audio jack. On the right-hand side, there's a Kensington lock, for those lucky enough to find such devices on sale, an HDMI 2.1, a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A, Thunderbolt 4 Type C, and a UHS-2 card reader. The power connector accommodates the unusual Razer power adapter cable. As you can see, if you connect it with the right angle power cord going to the rear of the chassis, all is well. If, however, you flip it round and the cable comes forward, you're blocking those USB ports on the left hand side. The keyboard has full per key RGB lighting, which works very well, controlled by Razer's Synapse software, just as you'd expect. Travel on the keys, very short. But then, of course, the chassis is very slender. So it's hard to criticize Razer for that, but the feel of the keyboard is okay without being brilliant. The glass touchpad is absolutely superb. Huge, works brilliantly well, big thumbs up. While we're on the subject of the keyboard, Razer has updated the speaker grills in the top deck for this 2022 version. And the consequence is the power button has moved from the deck into the keyboard which in turn moves the Dell key in board. I'm not massively pleased about that, but it's not the end of the world. But of course, Razer has to do with far more than 
this QWERTY keyboard user, there are many keyboards around the planet. Part of the assets we received from Razer for this review shows a number of different keyboard layouts, and it's only when you quickly flick through them that you see just how much work a manufacturer has to put into a whole range of options for the entire globe. I'm still not particularly keen about the movement of the Dell keyboard, but someone at Razer has had to work incredibly hard at this one small change. And as I've mentioned these speakers just in passing there, let's have a little listen. Sideways. So here we are, 10 minutes into my video and I'm not even touched on the... The speakers are controlled by some THX software. The kind thing is to show you a little bit of B-roll of this processor running with two cores at 5.5 gigahertz, which certainly looks impressive. It doesn't make a huge difference. The music the setting gives it a bit more bass. 5.5 gigahertz Cinema is a very is more neutral. Number. Let's get into the benchmarks. Game so sounds horribly compressed. Score. Let's go you back to music clock speed. and crank up the volume. Tiny step up from the overclock chaos, which is locked at 5.3 gigahertz or indeed 5.2 gigahertz. Very few points in it. Get over the top on full volume. On auto wins. Cinebench R15 multi-core. I think we can agree those speakers are surprisingly loud for a laptop. Remove six screws with the T5 Torx driver and the bottom cover comes away, revealing the battery, cooling fans, speakers, memory and the SSD under this little black heat shield. The vapor chamber is this huge great block of black which is a third of the area inside the chassis. And when you consider how thin the chassis is, you can see that the cooling system is absolutely integral to the construction of the Blade 15. The Razer Blade is controlled by Razer's Synapse software. We've got a number of modes that we can use as explained in Razer's literature. While balanced mode might sound like it's balanced. On paper it actually looks rather restrictive. Let's run 3D Mark and see what happens in balanced mode. We can see the GPU board power 94 watts, GPU clock speed 1300 and a few megahertz. Next up custom mode. We have a bunch of different custom modes to try. Let's go with custom high. We can hear the fans are louder. And there we can see a bump in the graphics score. And finally we go for custom boost mode. And we're done. This brings us neatly to the test results. In our testing we're using the MSI Raider GE76 as a comparator because it runs a slightly faster processor and the same graphics but can use higher power levels because it has a much larger chassis. So in the CPU element of 3 d Mark Time Spy we can see that the Razer Blade does tolerably well in balanced and custom high modes but when you run in custom boost mode it really starts to take off. In Bapco Crossmark, the Razer Blade does okay, but is sorely trounced by the MSI Raider. In Blender 3.1, we can see the Razer Blade in balanced mode is competing with the MSI Raider in silent mode. That balance mode is restrictive. Bump up the power levels to custom mode, and the blade starts to perform, but is beaten sorely by the MSI Raider running in its higher power modes. Cinebench R23, the Razer Blade in balanced mode is competing with the MSI Raider in silent mode. In Cinebench R23 single core, you wouldn't have thought that power would play much of a part in the equation, and here you can see the Razer Blade moves up the scale very slightly. 
it does a decent job. In games, we start with Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy at 1080p, and the blade does okay. It is crystal clear when you compare it to the Raider GE76 that the graphics are starved of power, and this is hurting frame rates. Far Cry New Dawn, it's a similar story. The blade does okay, but it's beaten soundly by the Raider. And again in Far Cry 6, you get a clear 10 FPS more with the MSI Raider than you do with the Blade. And also in Watch Dogs Legion, the Razor Blade's losing out to the tune of 5 to 10 FPS. The Razor redeems itself somewhat in our battery test, where the battery life is alright. PC Mark 10 flogs the system soundly for many hours. We have a useful battery life, but just look at that ROG Zephyrus G14 from Asus. AMD hardware is clearly much more efficient than Intel hardware. To wrap this up, what do I think of the Razer Blade 15 2022 edition? It's okay. I mean, I like it in many respects, but it's crystal clear to me that shoveling the RTX 3080 Ti graphics inside this tiny chassis, it gave Razer two choices. Either let it run at the power levels it wants to run at, in which case it's going to be hot, you're going to have to run the fans fast, and that'll make it noisy. Alternatively, do exactly what they did, which is throttle the hardware. Which begs the question, why have we got this hardware in this chassis? And I don't really have a satisfactory answer to that, but the overall results, as you've seen in our graphs, the, the Razer suffers. Pros, the good points. The screen is colourful, sharp and fast. Could be a touch brighter, but overall it's good. And that 360Hz is impressive. The touchpad, it's large, it's glass, it works brilliantly well. Love that. The Razer Synapse software works well. I'm not generally keen on manufacturer's own software. It's often a negative in many respects. In this instance, Synapse is a plus. Also, as a shout out to Razer, they make a feature of not including any other bloatware with this laptop, which is a completely good point and entirely true. And I didn't mention it in this review, so it's getting in here right at the end. Well done, Razer. Happy about your software. The styling and the premium feel. Yes, good points. Having said that, you probably think this Razer looks familiar. It could be a laptop you might think from three or four years ago. Uh, it has been tweaked slightly in recent times, but fundamentally it's unchanged. So while it looks and feels good, you have to wonder whether Razer is due to do a bit of an update in the near future. And the audio, uh, it's loud. It doesn't sound great. You always get a much better um, sound from a laptop with headphones, we all know that. Surprisingly loud, quality, all right. Overall, the audio goes in the positives for this laptop. Cons, the negative points. The price is very high. When we started talking to Razer, we were told the laptop was selling for £4,100 here in the UK. And after a bit of conversation, we noticed the website had changed and it's now £3,900. I can't say it's down to Kit Guru, but it is a fact. Nonetheless, you are paying a lot of money for the hardware. We know that Intel charges plenty for their hardware, but Nvidia would appear to charge far more. So it seems to us it's the Nvidia aspect of this laptop that's really hurting the pocket of the potential purchaser. The compact chassis restricts the power that's available for the CPU and the GPU, as covered already. This is absolutely true, and it makes it all the more painful that you're paying a blooming fortune for the RTX 3080 Ti graphics. You pay for them, the benefit you get in return, not so much. The keyboard action has a very short travel, so it's a very slender chassis. Necessarily, that means there's very little space for the keyboard. It feels okay, but it's not great. On the other hand, if the keyboard was better, you'd have a thicker chassis. I think, personally, I'd lean towards the better keyboard and the slightly thicker chassis. And finally, the power adapter, which is here. Weighs 700 grams, it's a perfectly reasonable unit, I'm happy with that. What I don't quite understand is why manufacturers such as Razer, who are charging a lot of money for a laptop like this, don't include a USB-C power delivery type charger in addition to the regular power brick. That would be limited to 100 watts, which means you couldn't game uh, and charge the laptop simultaneously, you'd just be slowing the rate of discharge of the battery. I understand that. Nonetheless, a charger that will cost us retail people 50 or so pounds would clearly cost the likes of Razer far less, and you could be guaranteed and certain it would be correct for the laptop in question, rather than potentially getting a generic charger that doesn't do the job. 
I personally think laptop manufacturers who include the USB-C charging feature should include a Type-C charger in addition to the larger power brick. Overall, it's worth considering. Were it to be significantly cheaper, it would go from a 7.5 to an 8. To my mind, laptops these days, 2.5 grand's about right. 4 grand, ouch.